You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Today, we're thrilled to present another special edition in which we take an older recording and rework it to include sound effects and ambient music. The Feast in the Abbey by Robert Bloch, which first appeared in Weird Tales in 1935, tells of a macabre horror encountered in a strange monastery deep in the woods. We hope you enjoy this reworking. The Feast in the Abbey, Special Edition Written by Robert Block Sound Design by Jennifer Gill Narration and Ambient Music by Ian Gordon 1. A clap of thunder in the sullen west heralded the approach of night and storm together, and the sky deepened to a sorcerous black. Rain fell, the wind droned dolefully, and the forest pathway through which I rode became a muddy, treacherous bog that threatened momentarily to ensnare both my steed and myself in its unwelcome embrace. A journey under such conditions is most inauspicious. In consequence, I was greatly heartened when shortly through the storm-tossed branches I discerned a flicker of hospitable light glimmering through mists of rain. Five minutes later, I drew rain before the massive doors of a goodly-sized, venerable building of grey, moss-covered stone, which, from its extreme size and sanctified aspect, I rightly took to be a monastery. Even as I gazed thus perfunctorily upon it, I could see that it was a place of some importance, for it loomed most imposingly above the crumbled foundations of many smaller buildings, which had evidently once surrounded it. The force of the elements, however, was such as to preclude all further inspection or speculation, and I was only too pleased when, in reply to my continued knocking, the great oaken door was thrown open, and I stood face to face with a cowled man who courteously ushered me past the rain-swept portals into a well-lighted and spacious hallway. My benefactor was short and fat, garbed in voluminous gabardine, and from his ruddy, beaming aspect seemed a very pleasant and affable host. He introduced himself as the Abbot Henricus, head of the monkish fraternity, in whose headquarters I now found myself, and begged me to accept the hospitality of the brethren, until the inclemencies of the weather had somewhat abated. In reply, I informed him of my name and station, and told him that I was journeying to keep tryst with my brother in Verone, beyond the forest, but had been arrested in my journey by the storm. These civilities having been concluded, he ushered me past the panelled antechamber to the foot of a great staircase set in stone, that seemed hewn out of the very wall itself. Here he called out sharply in an uncomprehended tongue, and in a moment I was startled by the sudden appearance of two blackamoors, who seemed to have materialised out of nowhere, so swiftly silent had been their coming. Their stern ebony faces, kinky hair, and rolling eyes, set off by a most outlandish garb, great baggy trousers of red velvet and waists of cloth of gold in eastern fashion, intrigued me greatly, though they seemed curiously out of place in a Christian monastery. The abbot Henricus addressed them now in fluent Latin, bidding one to go without and care for my horse, and ordering the other to show me to an apartment above, where, he informed me, I could change my rain-bedraggled garments for a more suitable raiment, while awaiting the evening meal. I thanked my courteous host, and followed the silent black automaton up the great stone staircase. The flickering torch of the giant servitor cast arabesque shadows upon bare stone walls of great age, and advanced decrepitude. Clearly the structure was very old. Indeed, the massive walls that rose outside must have been constructed in a bygone day, for the other buildings that presumably were contemporaneously erected beside this had long since fallen into irremediable, unrecognizable decay. Upon reaching the landing, my guide led me along a richly carpeted expanse of tessellated floor, between lofty walls tapestried and bedizened with draperies of black. 
Such velvet finery was most unseemly for a place of worship, to my mind. Nor was my opinion shaken by the sight of the chamber, which was indicated as my own. It was fully as large as my father's study at Nîmes, its walls hung in Spanish velvets of maroon, of an elegance surpassed only by their bad taste in such a place. There was a bed such as would grace the palace of a king. Furniture and other appurtenances were of truly regal magnificence. The blackamoor lighted a dozen mammoth candles in the silver candelabra that stood about the room, and then bowed and withdrew. Upon inspecting the bed, I found thereupon the garments the abbot had designated for my use during the evening meal. These consisted of a suit of black velveteen with satin breeches and hose of a corresponding hue, and a sable surplice. Upon doffing my travel-worn apparel, I found that they fitted perfectly, albeit most sombrely. During this time, I engaged myself in observing the room more closely. I wondered greatly at the lavishness, display, and ostentation, and more greatly still, at the complete absence of any religious paraphernalia. Not even a simple crucifix was visible. Surely this order must be a rich and powerful one, albeit a trifle worldly, perchance akin to those societies of Malta and Cyprus, whose licentiousness and extravagance is the scandal of the world. As I thus mused, there fell upon my ears the sounds of sonorous chanting, that swelled symphonically from somewhere far below. Its measured cadence rose and fell solemnly, as if it were borne from a distance incredible to human ears. It was subtly disturbing. I could distinguish neither words nor phrases that I knew, but the potent rhythm bewildered me. It whirled a malefic rune, fraught with insidious strange suggestion. Abruptly, it ceased, and I breathed unconsciously a sigh of relief. But not an instant during the remainder of my sojourn was I wholly free from the spark of unease generated by the far-distant sound of that nameless, measured chanting from below. Two. Never have I eaten a stranger meal than that which I partook of at the monastery of the abbot Henricus. The banquet hall was a triumph of ostentatious adornment. The meal took place in a vast chamber, whose lofty eminence rose the entire height of the building to the arched and vaulted roof. The walls were hung with tapestries of purple and blood royal, emblazoned with devices and escutcheons of noble, albeit to me unknown, significance. The banquet table itself extended the length of the chamber, at one end unto the double doors, through which I had entered from the stairs, the other end was beneath a hanging balcony, under which was the scullery entrance. About this vast festal board were seated some two-score churchmen in cowls and gabardines of black, who were already eagerly assailing the multitudinous array of foodstuffs with which the table was weighted. They scarcely ceased their gorging to nod a greeting when the abbot and I entered to take our place at the head of the table, but continued to devour rapaciously the wonderful array of victuals set before them, accomplishing this task in a most unseemly fashion. The abbot neither paused to motion me to my seat, nor to intone a blessing, but immediately followed the example of his flock, and proceeded directly to stuff his belly with choice titbits before my astounded eyes. It was certain that these Flemish barbarians were far from fastidious in their table habits. The meal was accompanied by uncouth noises from the mouths of the feasters. The food was taken up in the fingers, and the untasted remains cast upon the floor. The common decencies were often ignored. For a moment I was dumbfounded, but natural politeness came to my rescue, so that I fell to without further ado. Half a dozen of the black servants glided silently about the board, replenishing the dishes or bearing platters filled with new and still more exotic viands. My eyes beheld marvels of cuisine upon golden platters, verily, but pearls were cast before swine. For these cowled and hooded brethren, monks though they were, behaved like abominable boors. They wallowed in every kind of fruit, great luscious cherries, honeyed melons, pomegranates and grapes, huge plums, exotic apricots, rare figs and dates. 
There were huge cheeses, fragrant and mellow, tempting soups, raisins, nuts, vegetables, and great smoking trays of fish, all served with ales and cordials that were as potent as the nectar of Nepenthes. During the meal we were regaled with music from unseen lutes, wafted from the balconies above, music that triumphantly swelled in an ultimate crescendo as six servitors marched solemnly in, bearing an enormous platter of massy, beaten gold, in which reposed a single haunch of some smoking meat, garnished with and redolent of aromatic spices. In profound silence they advanced, and set down their burden in the centre of the board, clearing away the giant candelabra and smaller dishes. Then the abbot rose, knife in hand, and carved the roast, the while muttering a sonorous invocation in an alien tongue. Slices of meat were apportioned to the monks of the assemblage on silver plates. A marked and definite interest was apparent in this ceremony. Only politeness restrained me from questioning the abbot as to the significance of the company's behaviour. I ate a portion of my meat and said nothing. To find such barbaric dalliance and kingly pomp in a monastic order was indeed curious, but my curiosity was regrettably dulled by copious imbibing of the potent wine set before me at the table, in beaker, bumper, flask, flagon, and bejeweled cup. There were vintages of every age and distillation, curious fragrant potions of marvellous headiness and giddy sweetness that affected me strangely. The meat was peculiarly rich and sweet. I washed it down with great draughts from the wine vessels that were now freely circulating about the table. The music ceased, and the candle glow dimmed imperceptibly into softer luminance. The storm still crashed against the walls without. The liquor sent fire through my veins, and queer fancies ran riot through my addled head. I sat almost stupefied when, the company's trencher-mannish appetites being at last satisfied, they proceeded, under influence of the wine, to break the silence observed during the meal by bursting into the chorus of a ribald song. Leave all the sea, leave all the soul, Their mirth grew, the zoo, and broad jests and tales were told, adding to the merriment. Lean faces were convulsed in lascivious laughter, fat paunches quivered with jollity. Some gave way to unseemly noise and gross gesture, and several collapsed beneath the table and were carried out by the silent blacks. I could not help but contrast the scene with that in which I would have figured had I reached Verone to take my meal at the board of my brother, the good curé. There would be no such noisome ribaldry there. I wondered vaguely if he was aware of this monastic order so close to his quiet parish. Then, abruptly, my thoughts returned to the company before me. The mirth and song had given place to less savoury things, as the candles dimmed and deepening shadows wove their webs of darkness about the banquet board. Talk turned to vaguely alarming channels, and cowled faces took on a sinister aspect in the wan and flickering light. As I gazed bemused about the board, I was struck by the peculiar pallor of the assembled faces. They shone whitely in the dying light as with a distorted mockery of death. Even the atmosphere of the room seemed changed. The rustling draperies seemed moved by unseen hands. Shadows marched along the walls. Hobgoblin shapes pranced in weird processional over the groined arches of the ceiling. The festal board looked bare and denuded. Dregs of wine besmirched the linen. Half-eaten viands covered the table's expanse, the gnawed bones on the plate seemed grim reminders of mortal fate. The conversation was ill-suited to further my peace of mind. It was far from the pious exhortations expected of such a company. Talk turned to ghosts and enchantments. Old tales were told and infused with newer horror. Legends recounted in broken whispers. Hints of eldritch potency passed from wine-smeared lips in tones sepulchrally muted. I sat somnolent no longer. I was nervous with an increasing apprehension greater than I had ever known. It was almost as if I knew what was about to happen, when at last, with a curious smile, the abbot began his tale, and the monkish presences hushed their whispers and turned in their places to listen. 
At the same time, a black entered and deposited a small covered platter before his master, who regarded the dish for a moment, before continuing his introductory remarks. It was fortunate, he began, addressing me, that I had ventured here to stay the evening, for there had been other travellers whose nocturnal sojournings in these woods had not reached so fortunate a termination. There was, for example, the legendary Devil's Monastery. Here he paused and coughed abstractedly before continuing. According to the accepted folklore of the region, this curious place of which he spoke was an abandoned priory deep in the heart of the woods, in which dwelt a strange company of the undead devoted to the service of Asmodeus. Often, upon the coming of darkness, the old ruins took on a preternatural semblance of their vanished glory, and the old walls were reconstructed by demon artistry to beguile the passing traveller. It was indeed fortunate that my brother had not sought me in the woods upon a night like this, for he might have blundered upon this accursed place, and been bewitched into entrance, whereupon, according to the ancient chronicles, he would be seized, and his body devoured in triumph by the ghoulish acolytes, that they might preserve their unnatural lives with mortal sustenance. All this was recounted in a whisper of unspeakable dread, as if it were somehow meant to convey a message to my bewildered senses. It did. As I gazed into the leering faces all about me, I realized the import of those jesting words, the ghastly mockery that lay behind the abbot's bland and cryptic smile. The devil's monastery, subterrene chanting of the rites to Lucifer, blasphemous magnificence, but never the sign of the cross, an abandoned priory in the deep woods, wolfish faces glaring into my own. Then three things happened simultaneously. The abbot slowly lifted the lid of the small tray before him. Let us finish the meat, I think he said. Then I screamed. <coughs> Lastly came the merciful thunderclap that precipitated me, the laughing monks, the abbot, the platter, and the monastery into chaotic oblivion. When I awoke, I lay rain-drenched in a ditch beside the mired pathway, in wet garments of black. My horse grazed in the forest ways nearby, but of the abbey I could see no sign. I staggered into Verona a half-day later, and already I was quite delirious, and when I reached my brother's home, I cursed aloud beneath the windows. But my delirium lapsed into raving madness, when Hugh found me there, told me where my brother had gone and his probable fate, and I swooned away upon the ground. I can never forget that place, nor the chanting, nor the dreadful brethren, but I pray to God that I can forget one thing before I die, that which I saw before the thunderbolt, the thing that maddens me and torments me all the more in view of what I have since learned in Verone. I know it is all true now, and I can bear the knowledge, but I can never bear the menace, nor the memory of what I saw when the abbot Henricus lifted up the lid of the small silver platter to disclose the rest of the meat. It was the head of my brother. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.